Uh, the speaker for this talk is Adrian Copeland, PhD, is also a 2017 Canals Fellow at the Office of Ocean Exploration and Research at OAR and NOAA. Adrian is originally from Washington State and received her Bachelor of Science in Biology and a Certificate in Mathematical Biology from Washington State University. Adrienne received her PhD in zoology with a marine biology specialization from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2016. She has, been, she has been on over 20 seagoing expeditions and was chief scientist on six of these trips, including a 2014 research cruise on Schmidt's Ocean Institute's ship Falkor. Her title today is Using Sound to Understand Pelagic Predator Behavior, and please join me in welcoming Adrienne Copeland. Thanks guys for coming. Um, so this is a collaborative project between uh, University of Hawaii and Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center of NOAA. So um, patchiness of resources is very common in the terrestrial system and has pretty, been pretty well studied. However, it's also really common in the marine system and has not been that studied. And it's important to study this patchiness of resources because as you would predict by the f optimal foraging theory, the patchiness of these prey or resources might affect the distribution of predators. And the area I focused on was in Hawaii, and we've seen that for a couple studies in Hawaii that that has occurred. So there was one study um, by Woodworth et al. in 2011 that found that cyclonic eddies or cold core eddies that upwell nutrient-rich water to the surface actually seem to influence the distribution of melon-headed wells. They found that the melon-headed well tracks corresponded to the locations of these eddies. Another study by Benoit Bird et al. in 2003 found that um, the location of spinner dolphins seemed to correspond as well with higher densities of their prey. So here's a plot of the nope, okay. depth versus horizontal distance. And these little bullies here are spinner dolphins. And they found that these spinner dolphins were located in a layer that had higher density of micronecton. And um, micronecton are these organisms from about 2 to 20 centimeters. They mostly include fish, um, crustaceans, squid. And these micronecton are the prey of these spinner dolphins. And they might be an important link in the food web, linking primary producers or your phytoplankton with higher trophic levels, including tuna, marlin. And it's important to study these micronecton to get a better understanding of these dynamics. But micronecton are found um, within the deep scattering layer or the mesopelagic layer from about 300 meters to about 7 to 1,000 meters depending on where you are in the ocean. And there are deep diving tooth wells that will forage within these layers as well as below them. And based on the stomach contents of these deep diving tooth wells, they feed mostly on cephalopods and occasionally fish. And those cephalopods actually have been found to feed on these mesopelagic micronecton. So getting an understanding of about the distribution of these mesopelagic micronecton might lead to a better understanding about these deep diving tooth whales. Here's a picture on the top of a sperm whale and the bottom is a short fin pilot whale. And they both have um, a squid tentacle in the bottom one and squid body in the top one um, in these photos. And it's really rare actually to see the prey of these animals because they usually feed at depth. So these were really great pictures. So in Hawaii, we have um, four different types of deep diving odontocetes or tooth wells. We have beaked wells, short fin pilot wells, sperm wells, and resource dolphins. For my talk, I'm going to focus on the first three. And based on data from tags, which this is an example of a tag up top on a beaked whale, based on data from tags, we've seen that these whales will dive deep to feed, so they don't actually begin echolocating or clicking until they're down below, in this case, for the two beak twelve, about 500 meters. So you have depth across time. And the more bold, there we go, the more bold the line, that's when they start clicking. So you can see they're starting to click or search for food around 500 meters. And they do these buzzes at depth. And the buzzes indicate that they're actually honing in on prey. So we know that these species are not searching for food until they get deeper than the surface. And I again said that micronecton were about 300 to 1,000 meters. And you have these species feeding within and below the layer. So how do we study that relationship? We can't use normal 
surveys, lying transect surveys, because these animals are too deep for us to go down in scuba. Um, we can use a net to trawl through these layers. However, the nets um, will have net avoidance by animals as well as they can, um, some of the species within the layers are gelatinous, so they can be damaged in nets. So it's really hard to study the distribution of what's in these layers. So to do that, instead we use acoustics. So we use active acoustics, which is where you send out a ping into the water column and you look at the echoes that are returned from objects in the water. And you can use different frequencies to get different understandings of what's in the water. You can use higher frequencies to get better resolution of organisms. You can use lower frequencies to get deeper into the water column. And from that, we can, we can make assumptions and calculate to see what is in the water column. We can also use passive acoustics to understand the distribution of these deep diving tooth whales. So as I said, these tooth whales echolocate when they're searching for food. And based on the species, they have very stereotypical <coughs> clicks. And we can use an array of hydrophones, or underwater microphones in this case, um, to record those clicks. And using multiple different hydrophones, we can actually look at the time delay at the different hydrophones to get information about the location of these different individuals. So I said that these different individuals make stereotypical clicks. Um, two of the species, sperm whales and short fin pilot whales, make broadband clicks, where you have a range of frequencies over one time point. Sperm whales um, have lower frequency clicks compared to short fin pilot whales, and short fin pilot whales have these very stereotypical two peaks at 12 and 18 kilohertz that we can use to separate them. Short fin pilot whales are s similar to false killer whales, so for this study, we actually had visual confirmation of all the short fin pilot whales. Whereas beaked whales actually make frequency modulated clicks, um, their frequency will change over time. And the peak frequency, center frequency, is much higher than the other two species. So using the, both the passive and active acoustics, we can get information about the distribution of these different species and how that relates to the micronecton backscatter that we collected using active acoustics. So from there, we wanted to answer three different questions. Um, here's two pictures of some examples of what you would find in the mesopelagic micronecton layers. So the first question we want to ask is if there was patchiness of this micronecton backscatter, and what environmental or geographic features were associated with this variability. Based on past studies um, using active acoustics to study micronecton, we hypothesized that the patchiness would vary and that with areas closer to shore at shallower depths, higher chlorophyll A values, and higher sea surface temperature would have more micronecton backscatter. A second question was if there was variability in the distribution of deep diving tooth whale foragers. And based on some work done in the main Hawaiian Islands, we hypothesized that these different species would be found at different bathymetries. And finally, what is the relationship between the micronecton distribution and these whale foragers? And we hypothesized that the whales would be foraging in areas with higher micronecton backscatter. And we hypothesized this because, again, that micronecton is forage for some of the prey that these whales eat. So this study was done uh, from May 8 to June 14, 2013, on board the NOAA ship Oscar Elton Seti. And we did um, transects throughout the northwestern Hawaiian Islands from Middle Bank all the way to Pearls and Hermes at Toll. And we used a calibrated Simrad EK60 echo sounder, and that was our active acoustics that collected the backscatter of these micronecton. And we had a hydrophone array detecting the echolocation clicks of the three species I mentioned. So what does the active acoustics get you? So this is called an echogram. And you have depth across distance. So this is your surface. That's your ocean bottom. And these colored dots are your backscatter. So this is what is in the water column that's reflecting the echoes back to the surface. Based on the color of the backscatter, you can tell um, the, the amount. So the more green the color, the higher the backscatter, the more gray, the lower the backscatter. And you'll see in this case, which was common throughout the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, you have a shallow scattering layer from about 0 to 270 meters, and you have a deep scattering layer from 370 to 670 meters in this case. So this was 70 kilohertz data. Um, 
So it was depth limited to 670 meters. The deep scattering layer sometimes will extend past that, but I couldn't um, collect that with this, with this technique. So we, because of that, we only analyzed sections where the bottom was deeper than that 670 meters, and I removed the data below 670 meters. And to analyze this backscatter, um, we gridded the data. So we bend it into cells with a 200 meter horizontal resolution and a 10 meter vertical resolution. And I integrated those bend cells to get the nautical area scattering coefficient, NOSC, and it's just a way to represent the average backscatter over that area. So this is what the data looks like throughout the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, this was over 30,000 bends. And the color represents the average backscatter in the water column from 0 to 670 meters. And the more red the color, oops, sorry. The more red the color, the higher the backscatter. The more blue the color, the lower the backscatter. So if we get back to question number one, I wanted one, I wanted to know if there was even var variability throughout the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, because we didn't know. And we saw, yes, there was variability. There's, there appeared to be areas where there was higher backscatter. And these areas appear to be um, inshore and at shallower depths near atolls. So we wanted to test that and see if that was really the case. So we used a generalized additive model, or GAM. It's similar to a linear regression where you fit a line to your data, but instead of a straight line, it's going to be a curved line. And so I wanted to see um, how this log of the backscatter varied as a function of the, sea, the average surface chlorophyll, as well as the sea surface temperature. <coughs> And then I also wanted to see how it varied from bathymetry and from the distance from shore. And so here are the results. Um, so we have on the y-axis the log of that backscatter, and then on the x-axis I have my different parameters. So the top left is the chlorophyll A parameter, and then we have depth on the top right, distance from shore on the bottom left, and sea surface temperature <coughs> on the bottom right. Um, so for chlorophyll A, we had hypothesized that as chlorophyll A increased, or the primary production at the surface increased, um, that the log of the backscatter would also increase. Um, and we saw that to be the case, and that was significant. Um, and then we saw again that depth and distance from shore has also seemed to affect the distribution of the micronecton with areas closer to shore and at shallower depths having higher log backscatter. While sea surface temperature was significant, there doesn't seem to be much variability in it, so I don't really have much to say on really how sea surface, attemp sea surface temperature was related to this log of box better. So for our next question, so now we know there was variability in the micronecton. We want to see if there was variability in the beak swell, sperm well, and short fin pilot well distribution. So I plotted the detection, so the the echolocation clicks that we detected from these different species over the bathymetry, and we wanted to see if these whales were found in specific depth areas. And we found that, yes, it seemed to vary between the different species, and the beaked whales actually had the short shortest or narrowest depth range from about 1,500 meters down to about 3,000 meters is the water depth where they were detected in. Short fin pilot whales were more, more commonly detected in the shallow depth ranges compared to the other species where sperm whales were more commonly detected in the deeper depth ranges when compared to this species. So we know now that, yes, there was variability in the detection of these different species. Yes, there's variability in the micronecton backscatter distribution. So how do those two relate? So I went ahead and plotted the top 1% of the backscatter as dots, and then the Xs are the detections of the different species. So um, the light blue, oops, so the light blue corresponds to the deep scattering layer hotspots, the top 1% of backscatter in the deep scattering layer hotspot. And that um, deep scatter layer, again, is from about 370 meters down to 670 meters. The purple is the shallow scattering layer, so from 0 to 270 meters. And the Xs in this case are beak twells, and beak twells were detected in 243 different bins. And we see that there appears to be overlap between the X's and the dots, if you look closely. Um, so we also did that, too, with short fin pilot whales. And short fin pilot whales were detected 523 times. And again, there seems to be a good overlap between the X's and the dots. But sperm whales, while they were detected quite often compared to the other two species, there doesn't seem to be that nice overlap. They seem to be kind of 
all over the place. So we wanted to test if that was statistically significant. So um, we used a logistic regression, and we wanted to see as the amount of backscatter increased, what was the probability of detecting these different species. So we thought for big 12s, as the shallow scattering layer increased, the probability of detecting a beak whale also increased, which went along with our hypothesis. Um, the deep scattering layer, while we saw the same relationship, it wasn't significant. And for the whole water column, we saw that same relationship. So we want to see the same for short fin pilot whales. And again, we actually saw for all cases, as the amount of backscatter of micronecton increased, the probability of seeing these, this species also increased. But for sperm whales, um, contrary to our hypothesis, we saw an inverse relationship. We saw as these backscatter in these different layers increased, the probability of seeing a sperm whale decreased, which was contrary to what we would think. Um, part of the things that we think might be the reason for this is that sperm whales were more often detected in those deeper waters, like I had said before. And if we remember, the micronectin backscatter was higher inshore and at shallower depths. So maybe that's the reason why we see this inverse relationship. So there's something else going on that's driving um, sperm whale behavior. So in summary, we wanted to see first if there was patchiness in the micronecton. And we saw that, yes, there was. And it seemed to correspond to um, shallow depths and inshore having higher amounts of backscatter, as well as as the chlorophyll A satellite surface or sorry, sea, sea surface chlorophyll A um, increased the log of the backscatter also increased. And then we wanted to see if there was variability in the deep diving tooth whale foragers. And we saw, yes, there was. Um, we saw that the beak trails had the narrowest depth range. The short fin pilot whales preferred the shallow depth ranges. And the, deep, the sperm whales seemed to prefer deeper waters. And again, I mentioned that all three of these species forage on similar items based on stomach contents from these species. So while they prefer to forage on similar things, these different species were found in different habitats. So this potentially suggesting niche partitioning between the different species. And it would be really interesting to investigate that further. And finally, we wanted to see what the relationship between these distributions were and the whale foragers. And we found that as um, the amount of micronecton backscatter increased, the probability of detecting a short fin pilot whale and beak whales also increased, which is what we had hypothesized. We saw an inverse relationship for sperm whales. So in conclusion, um, we saw that micronecton backscatter varied in space and time. Time portion I didn't really get into today, but it is in my dissertation if you're interested. And we saw that that influenced um, the distribution of these two species. So again, these micronecton while not necessarily prey of these two whales, they are prey of the, the forage of these whales. So maybe that the distributions of these species are influencing the distribution that these whales are foraging on. So currently, we have some main, main Hawaiian Islands transects going on to compare and get a more um, main Hawaiian Island versus northwestern Hawaiian Island comparison of this micronecton distribution. We also hope to trawl in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, I didn't get into it. Unfortunately, a lot of this data, we didn't have trawling to confirm the species in the deep scattering layer. We do in the main Hawaiian Islands, but in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, due to it being part of the monument, we can't trawl. And then finally, um, we had an Island of Hawaii cruise last spring, and we're looking at the temporal difference of these scattering layers. And I have a lot of th people to thank. And I'll take any questions. Yes, Max. That was really interesting. Thanks. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were like together, yeah. And no influence of the echo sounder on so I did not mention this. Uh, the 38 does. So um, we used, uh, so the ship, the SETI, has a 38 kilohertz, 70, 120, and 200, very similar to the Oceanus Explorer. Um, the 38 kilohertz does interfere with the, um, the hydrophone, and it does make it hard to detect B12s, which is why they turn it, the 38 off, and which is why I'm presenting with the 70 kilohertz. That, that leads very well into my second question. Yeah. 
which was um, you, know, you could speculate about maybe different species in the deep scattered layer in different areas and how you might have discriminated that if you multiple frequencies. Yes. Um, so I did have 38 kilohertz of data. Um, it was pretty messy. The, the goal was so you can actually use different. I'll get back. So his question was um, how could you discriminate um, different species in these layers? So you can actually use frequency differencing between different frequencies of the echo sounder to get at some at least functional groups. It's really hard to do it in the deep scattering layer because um, you can't isolate individuals. So, but there is some work being done on that to look more at the, the cumulative SV and how that changes over um, frequencies. So the goal was, um, since we're doing the deep scattering layer, we only really have two frequencies we can work with to do that work because the other frequencies don't go deep enough. So you can use the 38 and the 70. And there has been some work doing that. Unfortunately, most of my data, the 38, was messy. So I couldn't really isolate that. Um, we are doing some stuff, though, with that off the island of Hawaii. And we're looking at very detailed, and we're actually comparing it to trawl, too. So I actually presented on that at the ASA last year, last May, um, looking at the the frequency differencing um, for the SV overall between the 38 and 70 and compared it to trawl to kind of get at that a little bit. Um, but it's really hard in the deep sky layer because you can't isolate individuals. Yeah. I don't remember which type of whale it was. You said you had visual confirmation for all of them? Is that uh, it's for short fin pilot whales, yes. Um, so. No, so we have um, we have marine mammal observers that stand on the bridge. Well, they'll stand on the flying bridge up top, and they ha have these big eyes, are binoculars. They're really big, and they stare out at at the water all day, every day, to confirm what species they're seeing and the distance. And they're actually really good. They can tell you how far away the whale, how away the whale is, what species it is. They estimate group size. Yeah, they've been trained to do that. So. So you're not the, the other, the 38 frequency that can see deeper, do you think potentially the sperm whales were looking yeah. that that yeah. could So that is one thing I, I had gotten to in my dissertation but didn't mention here. Yeah, we did. So, um, and it's interesting too, so I actually did work also in the Gulf of Mexico and also in the main Hawaiian Islands. And in the Gulf of Mexico, I used a 38. And there was a relationship between the sperm whales there and the 38 kilohertz. Um, but it's important to note in the sperm whale, sperm whales in the Gulf have a slightly different behavior. They actually, compared to tag data within the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico, the sperm whales in the Gulf of Mexico dive shallower when they feed. Um, so that might be why there is this stronger relationship. Um, but yeah, so it would be interesting to to get more 38 kilohertz data without throughout Hawaii where the sperm whales dive deeper to see if there's still that relationship. I have two more questions. I don't know much about the process. I'm going to ask that last time. Yeah. How, when you have messy data, what does that mean? Why isn't it good? Like, why oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so by messy data, I mean actually sea state was interfering with my data. So um, this presentation, this was not a targeted active acoustics cruise. It was a targeted passive acoustics cruise. So they were going quite fast. The ship was going anywhere from like 6 to 10 knots sometimes. For an acoustics cruise, a lot of times we want to go around 4 knots. So we get a nice calm sea day. We don't get the smacking of the ship on the hull. We don't get bubbles. It's, and it looks pretty. Um, but this, they were going pretty fast. The ship was smacking a lot. So you get spikes that come up into your data. And so that echo gram I showed you all the way back. This is where you realize you have too many anima animations, right? <clears throat> okay, so here, so what you'd have is you'd start getting spikes that come all the way up into your data. And so you start having to remove those pings as spikes, because you can't analyze that, because I need, I need very clean signal. And you start removing too much of your data. Like if I'm removing over 50% of my data that I'm integrating over, you can't. I can't with confidence say that I'm I'm collecting all the variability. So, and these are this is clean data. Like so, normally I'll have noise bins that come up into the data too, and I'll remove all that. And, yeah. I have a question from the chat. Oh gosh, uh, who's it from? Can I ask that? From Woody. Okay. Uh, were you able to distinguish location and depth 
amongst the different species based on passive acoustics in the context of whale tracking? Um, so we were able to determine location, and we usually have visual confirmation of it too. Um, we can't, con we could not determine depth of, of the species though, um, because we didn't have a three-dimensional array. But, but yeah, we could determine. Um, we you get left-right ambiguity ambiguity with a, an array, but we we would have visual confirmation of it. So, and a lot of times we'd turn the ship to confirm that they were on that side and whatnot. So yes. Yes, Rachel. How your research <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so uh, there hadn't been, so that we're just starting to do a three, they're doing a three-year campaign in the Pacific called the High Seas to actually look at the distribution of these different species. There has not been a full, like, so... Other areas you can actually get like number of individuals in the population, like how healthy is your population, and we really don't have a good assessment of the number of individuals in these different species. So they're starting that now. They're going to use passive acoustics on the NOAA ships to try to get number of individuals. And so the, the goal of this was to help understand how they're utilizing the habitat as well, so that way we could better understand why they're there or if they're going to be there and the probability of their being there, them being there. The hope is if we could pursue this more is that we could actually estimate where they're going to be and when so that way we can better protect them because some of these under the marine animal protection are great. Thank you guys.